And as people are continuing to get into the waiting room and I invite them into the meeting, I will go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Candace Bannister and I'm the executive director of the Tread of Pioneers Museum. I'd like to welcome everybody tonight to our virtual uh, interview with these young promising athletes. Um, I have a series of questions that I'll be asking them and then we will then open it up for questions that have come through the chat tonight. Um, so you'll see there is a chat function um, at the bottom of your Zoom screen. You can send it to everyone or you could select through the drop down. You can send the questions just to me. And if we have time at the end, I'll be able to submit those. Um, but we do have a series of questions that we wanna make sure to get through. Um, I'll go ahead and ask our athletes, Tess and Alexa and Annika to go ahead and unmute. And then everyone else should be muted by default um, with how we've set up um, the Zoom. Um, I wanna thank the athletes um, for joining us. I know when they probably started into sports and Nordic combined, they didn't necessarily sign up for <laughs> interviews and things like this, um, but on the path they're going, they're probably gonna need to get used to all this. Um, so um, without further ado, we'll go ahead and um, start by having the athletes introduce themselves themselves. Um, what I'll be doing is having questions that are either for individual athletes or I'll have um, questions for everyone. And um, if the question is for everyone, we'll be going in order, alphabetical order by last name. So Tess will answer first because her last name starts with an A, then we'll go to Alexa and then we'll go to Annika. So why don't we go ahead and start with um, Tess, if you'd like to start by introducing yourself, and then we'll go on to Alexa and Annika. Hi, I'm Tess Arnone. Uh, hi, I'm Alexa Brayback. Great. And Annika? All right, you guys got cut out. Um, my name is Annika Malasinski and I'm on the USA National Nordic Combined Team. Great, thanks. And then Alexa, just a little housekeeping. Um, if you can move as close as you can to your microphone, your audio is really soft and Tess and Annika's is really strong. So we wanna make sure to keep you um, similar. Okay, so we're gonna start with the basics here. First, for those of us that may be unfamiliar, let's talk a little bit about the sport of Nordic combined. Not everybody is familiar, even in Steamboat Springs with the, the ins and outs of Nordic combined. So I'm gonna start with test. And can you briefly, when someone asks you in the elevator, what is Nordic combined? Can you tell us what that is? Nordic combined is a sport where you are ski jumping and cross country skate skiing. Um, both Nordic events where your heel isn't attached down, but then you jump and based on your results, you then ski as far forward as you can. Great. And then we'll go to Alexa next. In your opinion, how does the U.S.'s Nordic combined program compare to the rest of the world? Um, the U.S.'s Nordic combined program is um, especially compared to like Norway, which is dominating the sport, lagging but uh, Nordic Combined originally came from Norway and like Finland and places out there, so yeah. Okay, um, so now let's talk a little bit about each of you and growing up and training in Steamboat Springs. So we'll start with all of you, for all the athletes, starting with Tess. Were you born here? And if not, how did you come? I was born here. Okay, and Alexa? I was also born here. And Annika. Um, I was also born here, but I have dual citizenship to Finland. Okay. Um, and then in the same answering order, um, when and what age did you begin in the Steamboat Springs Winter Sports Club Nordic Combined Program? And how did, how did you come to the sport? We'll start to we'll start with Tess. Um, I've been kind of in it as long as I can remember. I started like Hitchens Brothers uh, Wednesday night jumps when I was three, uh, just kind of, you know, going off the bump jump. And then, I mean, 
as soon as I was old enough, which I, I'm not sure, I think it might be like eight, but um, going into Little Vikings and starting Nordic Combined. And Alexa? Um, I didn't start Nordic Combined until I was about 12, but I started skiing when I was two. And I moved through the program, starting in racing and then moguls before I finally committed to Nordic Combined. And what was it, that thing that sort of, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, that pulled you from moguls to Nordic Combined? Um, well, I quit moguls because it, the jump scared me, which is kind of ironic, <laughs> but the ski jumps, like, there's nothing that compares to flying and that adrenaline is just unmatched. I have heard that. Annika, what about you? Um, I actually was very late into the game. I was a gymnast for about 14 years. And then at 16, I decided I wanted to try the sport of ski jumping. Wow. Awesome. And then here you are very, very quickly. That's pretty, pretty yeah. impressive. Yeah. Okay. So we'll start. Um, I'll go back to Tess on this one. Um, why did you choose Nordic Combined initially and what did you like most about it? Um, initially when I had to choose between ski racing and Nordic Combined, I chose Nordic Combined because it was a smaller field and I looked like I had more of a, kind of more of a chance. I hate to say it, I did take it, take it because it was a smaller field and I had a better chance of like doing well when there's not as many girls, but yeah. Um, We've grown, so that's good. Yeah, and then um, and then we'll go to um, Alexa on this one. What was your favorite part of Nordic Combined? And you you kind of alluded to this was the adrenaline of flying. Um, so it's not the burn of your lungs during the cross country skiing. It's the adrenaline of the skiing of the ski jumping. Well, there's kind of two parts. One of the things that like drew me towards Nordic Mind over ski jumping was that uh, with Nordic Mind, it really does come down at the end to how much effort you're putting into it. And I really like that ability to be able to like just give it all and like know that and walk away knowing I accomplished that. Great. Um, so this next one's for Annika. Um, how has the Steamboat Springs Winter Sports Club shaped your athletic career and you as a person? Um, I have traveled a lot when I was younger. Like I said, I have dual citizenship, but um, the Winter Sports Club definitely pushed me. Uh, it was a very new sport and scary at the age of 16. So um, I'm really glad that they gave me a chance and gave me the best um, options and a really good coaching right off the bat. Great. Um... I know the winter, the winter sports club has probably shaped all of you in some way. Alexa or Tess, do you want to um, talk about that at all, about how this program, you know, this town has sort of impacted you with Nordic Combined? Tess, do you want to answer that or Alexa? Um, yeah, I mean, like the club says, it takes a village and I don't think that could be any less true because, I mean, it takes everyone in Steamboat through the Winter Sports Club. And there's so many, you know, uh, like donors and without them, there's no way that a lot of us could, you know, continue doing skiing. And, you know, inside each uh, team, there is a little community that comes together, you know, from the itty bitties to us, I guess. Yeah. Alexa, what about you? Do you have a perspective on that, on the Winter Sports Club and how it's impacted your career? Uh, I, I think it's a really amazing community. Uh, I've met so many amazing people and have created a lot of friendships out of it. Great. Um, okay, so we'll go... Um, to Annika then on this one, what is it like to train at House and Hill knowing that so many exceptional athletes have trained there and will continue to? 
Um, it's really awesome to, you know, look at all the alumni and go into the Olympian Olympic Hall and see all the names up on the flags. And I'm so fortunate to be able to live in Steamboat and having a ski jump here, I think really just pushed me to try this new sport. And um, yeah, I'm really fortunate that I was able to grow up here and be part of the sport club. Great. Um, so now we'll talk a little history, a little historical perspective, which is one of the reasons why we wanted to interview you. Um, it's important for the museum to recognize sort of the continuum of history that started with Carl Halson all the way up to what the 2010 Olympic team did, all the way up to what you're doing now and going to continue to do, hopefully in the 2026 Olympics. Carl Halson was the first to build the ski jumps in town. He also was the first to establish the ski clubs, including the Steamboat Springs Winter Sports Club and specifically the Women's Ski Club. In 1914 and 15 in Steamboat, women were learning to ski and many young girls took to the jumps. What is it like knowing that a foundation was laid for you and now you can continue to make history by working toward the Olympics over a hundred years later? And I wanna propose this to all the athletes, this question, Tess, you can go first. Um, I mean, it's amazing to know that from the beginning, it was intended to kind of have the same like, oh, there is a path for both male and female. I think it has been a little tough with uh, just IOC and FIS creating equal opportunities, but I mean, it's it feels nice to know that there was some intent to have it um, more equal at least here in Steamboat Springs. Yes. <laughs> what about Annika or Alexa, you're next. Um, any perspective on sort of that, even back in 1915, Carl Halson made a real effort um, in a totally different time and place to, to make sure that women were part of the skiing scene. Um, I feel very fortunate because I've gained so many opportunities from this and that's just like amazing that and now we can look forward to competing in the Olympics, which is pretty much everybody's dream, I think, or at least it's mine. For sure. And Annika, do you have a perspective on this question? Um, so I was actually the team mascot in the Olympics of 2002. So um, I kind of like grew up in the field of Nordic combined just with the guys team and my brother starting pretty young. But um, yeah, just a couple of years ago, we didn't know at all where the sport would grow to. And I think we're so fortunate to be along with this ride and just watch the sport grow and people be backing us up and supporting us. Yeah, and I, um... We will probably get to this, to the coaches, but one of the things that I always talk about, at least as an observer on the outside, that's not an athlete in this sport is this um, idea that we have these incredible athletes who then, you know, go to the Olympics and then they come back and perhaps they settle here again or have families here and then come back to coach. Do you have a perspective on the quality of coaching in addition to the ski jumps that are available to you in Steamboat Springs? Tess, I'll start with you. I mean, yeah, it's amazing to have, you know, like Todd Wilson, um, recently Todd Lodwick has kind of joined us, but I mean, they have the experience of, you know, being at the Olympics and I mean, most, if not all coaches, most, um, did ski jump or Nordic combined or cross country ski at one point. And I think that is important to kind of get like their feedback as well. Cause I mean, they were an athlete as well. Right. Does it make it seem more attainable when you're being coached by someone who's actually accomplished it? Sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else want to answer that question as far as your, uh, the availability of excellence in coaching? Um, I'd like to add that I think Carl Denny, our U18, U20 coach, does a great job with um, 
you know, trying to see the perspective of women's athletes and just being really up to date with like studies of nowadays athletes instead of, you know, um, Todd Lodwick does an amazing job too, but um, it's been a while since, I mean, our sport has grown since he was in the Olympics. So I think it's great to have, you know, nowadays perspective. For sure. Awesome. Um, this is a, this is a question for all of you and we'll start with Tess. Um, Steamboat has a record number of Olympic and World Cup athletes from this town. Do you have any local heroes from this list? Who do you look up to and why? I've always found this question really hard and on a lot of like bios or when we go to competitions. And I think anyone that is, you know, uh, fully committed or like putting in a commitment to be uh, an athlete or go to such a level, I look up to them because I, I feel like I know how much it takes and just knowing that, you know, there are other people out there with doing it with you and that have done it before you. I think that just all of them deserve to be looked up to. Awesome. Uh, we'll go to Alexa next. Who are your heroes on the, well, really any list, but on our, ideally on our local steamboat list. Um, that it's definitely a hard one. I mean, I definitely look up to like all of the Nordic miners that came out of this club because like, I feel like I'm following the same path as them and that really like, it means something. And then like, I also look up to like Anne Vitell who was a mortal spear and yeah. Great, and Annika? Um, I'm kind of up with Tess. I think that anyone that commits to being an athlete and has dreams and goals um, should already be looked up to. But I think my biggest one is definitely the boys Nordic combined team, um, Billy DeMong, Todd Lodwick, Johnny Spillane, that kind of that group. That was a pretty magic moment for them, for the sport, for this town. It was pretty, pretty magical. Um, Okay, we'll go on. Um, let, I'll start with Tess on this one. Um, typically, what is your seasonal training schedule? Um, I mean, we train um, May through like March kind of. I mean, we get some time off in uh, um, in the fall, but it's kind of a year round. Uh, situation but may through like march is with the team and with the club and how important is that summer jumping option that we have here with the plastic jumps is that still to me or sure let's do it yeah um i think it's really important because i mean even taking a little break like this spring is sometimes tough going back um it's all muscle memory, but sometimes that you were working on something that you got at the end of the season and it's gone by the spring or the beginning of the summer. So I think if that gap was bigger, it might be a bigger issue. Would it be helpful if there were more um, jumps plastic here for you, Tess? I mean, I wouldn't complain, but at the same time we have, what we have is amazing. Awesome. Um, okay, so we'll go to Alexa on the next one. Um, and you, you kind of uh, referred to this a little bit earlier, but when did you know that you wanted to pursue Nordic Combined further? Was there a specific competition? You, you mentioned the feeling of flight and accomplishment. Um, was there a certain sort of time, day, moment where you realized like, this is going to be my thing and I'm going to be excellent um it definitely like wasn't a moment because for a long time I was doing multiple sports at once and I slowly like as the training got more intense and there was more days a week I was like okay I need to pick something and I love to combine and that's what I'm gonna go with I mean 
yeah, I mean, I still play soccer too, so I wouldn't, like, obviously I'm committed, but, like, it, I never really was like, I'm just going to pick North Combine and that's all I'm going to do. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Um, and then we'll go to Annika on this one. Have you had any major injuries as a direct result of training or competing in Nordic combined? And is the sport, this is a two-part question, is the sport considered more or less dangerous than other winter sports? Um, I did have a fall on the 60 in the beginning of the winter of 2018 and ended up dislocating my shoulder and putting me out for the season since I did have to get surgery. But um, I do think that really any sport you choose can be dangerous in its own way. And as you could fall and ski jumping, um, have some crashes and whatnot, um, not, it doesn't always end bad. You know, uh, we crash a lot, especially on plastic and on the snow and it's not always a bad outcome. So it, it's really the, I think every sport has, can have a bad outcome. Um. I would like to add that for a gravity sport, like um, like skiing gravity sports, it's relatively safe compared to like ski racing or moguls or those ones because the landing hill follows your like path as like in your air, you're never like going up and then coming down, like the landing hill follows you. So it's, there's not as many injuries as you think. Uh, that's at least my personal experience. So it's deceptive that way because it, yes. lo it looks like you're jumping to your death, but because of the, the slope of the hill, it's actually working with your landing in a way that it's not quite as scary for you as it is for us to watch you. <laughs> yes. Would you say that's accurate? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, okay, so now, now we're going to move on um, to the Olympics and some aspects of the sport related to the difference between the men's and women's programs. And again, some of these questions will be for all three of you and some will be uh, to one of you. So um, let's go ahead and start with Tess on this. Um, every other sport features men and women, but Nordic combined. The sport debuted at the World Cup level and in the World Championships this year, the latest benchmarks towards the International Ski Federation's goal to get the sport in the 2026 Olympics. Originally, it was planned to debut in 2022, but these plans changed and it's now being considered for 2026. What was your, what was your initial response to this news and what is your response now? Initially, it was quite a, like, I don't know, like four years, that's kind of a lot. Like, but now I'm like, I wouldn't be opposed to it being in the 22. Like, I think that'd be a great experience, but I personally just don't quite feel ready. And I don't, I mean, I think that women's Nordic combined should be in the 2022, but I don't think that like, personally, I would be there because I don't know if I, like, and personally ready to be at that level, if that makes sense. So the extra time, though originally not the best reason it was given, can be of a benefit to you in the long run. Yeah, it gives me four more years to get to the best I can possibly be. I don't know, it's kind of, you know, a blessing in disguise. At first you hate it, but I mean, you take what you're given. Right. And you make the best of it, right? Yes. Uh, Alexa and Annika, do you guys have a differing or similar perspective to Tess on that? Do you want to go first, Alexa? Uh, sure. Um, I also like similarly think that like, it's kind of a blessing in disguise. Like, I would love to be like, say I like, could be heading off to the Olympics this, in 2022, which is like next season but at the same time like I'm gonna be a junior in high school next year so like I've got some working some time to work with to like get where I need to be um 
I, on the other hand, think that our sport has grown so fast um, where, you know, it's not just easy to get on the team anymore. If you're looking, if you're looking at the other national North Carolina team girls, they're really kicking ass. And I think that seeing that and seeing our, our world champs and seeing how we've compete, competed, I think that we should have been in the 2022 Olympics. Do you have any insight as to why it was moved four years? Um, I think it's just that perspective that everyone has that it's such a new sport and it's just coming to the surface. And I don't think that people are really looking at our performances and how some of the top girls are actually doing. So I think everyone's still in that headspace that this is just such a new sport and it's too early to throw us into 2022 Olympics. Makes sense. Um, okay, so this is a question for all of you um, because it's so subjective and we'll start with Tess. What would it mean to you to have an Olympic experience? I mean, it's been a goal of mine for as long as I can remember. And I think it's hard to put a, like what it would mean, but it, I think reaching for our goals just as athletes is like a big part of our lives. And when you finally get to one, it's just the greatest feeling ever. And I think that because the Olympics is such like a large goal that, um, it might even feel better. What about you, Alexa? Um, I think going to the Olympics would definitely be a highlight of my life. Um, just like, it's, yeah, you can't explain it. it would be, it's just so cool. And Annika, do you have a perspective on, I'm sure you do. <laughs> um, I have wanted to go to the Olympics since I was so young and initially, initially I wanted to go for gymnastics, but, um, that got too hard on my body. And when I tried to decide a sport that was, that I was going to try to do, um, I picked Nordic combined and I think it would mean the world if I could go to the Olympics and, you know, really show that. Um, anything is possible. And I hear um, Tess and Alexa that you went to the Youth Olympics in 2020. Tell us about that experience. We'll start with Tess. It was amazing. I'm, it's, I mean, thinking back on it, um, I mean, I made so many friends that I still talk to there and I feel like I did pretty well and I mean, Alexa and I were really close. We uh, ended up jumping very close together and skiing together. And I think it was a great experience. Um, if that is even, if the Olympics are anywhere near how great those were, I would be pretty happy. What about you, Alexa? Um, yeah, the Youth Olympics was definitely like one of my favorite events I went to. It's just, you're in this like bubble of just athletics and other athletes that are just so committed to a sport that they love. Even if it's not the same sport as you, you just, you can feel that and it just makes it all that more cool. And also you get to meet athletes that do other sports, whereas like at normal like World Cup or COCs, I'd, we're just seeing all the other Nordic combiners. So that's another aspect that's really cool. That is, it sounds amazing. Um, this will go to all of you too. So we'll start with Tess. Um, what would it mean to you to be one of the very first? So this is a little bit different than this, the previous question. What would, be, what would it mean to you to be one of the very first to attend in a newly created Olympic sport? So it's kind of beyond just the idea of the Olympics, but actually pioneering a new sport being women's Nordic combined? I mean, I personally feel that I've been to a lot of firsts um, and 
there's almost a sense of more pressure kind of because it's like oh we have to prove that we deserve to be here which shouldn't be but it's great to see just I feel like everyone kind of steps up at that point and really is just doing their best and go I went to the for the exhibition event uh for junior world champs and then youth olympics was the first time they had uh women's nordic mind at any olympic level youth or I mean they didn't they don't have uh actual Olympics. And then all three of us this year were at the World Cup and at World Championships. And I, it's kind of weird being part of history because it's like, oh, this is just like what I'm doing. Like these are the next steps, but our names are on the papers for the first events. And I think that's pretty cool. It is for sure. Alexa, you want to go next on that question on what it's like pioneering a new sport in the Olympics if you're there in 2026? Uh, yeah, I really hope that like I can help inspire some of some more younger uh, women's Nordic miners because if we want to keep it in the Olympics, we definitely need to keep growing this sport. So I really just hope I can inspire other girls to take this on. Yeah, you've, you've got a wide road to pave, don't you, to not only prove it to get there and start it, but then the momentum to keep it going. I, com I completely understand that. And Annika? Um, I think in general, it's so awesome. Like, just like Alexa said, we're paving the way for other young women. And um, everything that we're doing is going down in history. And I just can't wait to tell all my experiences when I'm older and um, just kind of brag that like, yeah, this is, we made history and um, what a cool experience. For sure. I'm glad you, I'm glad you see it that way because it is a big deal. <laughs> um, okay, so we'll go back to Tess on this one. Um, you can be honest, what it what is it like to be a woman athlete in a male dominated sport? It's tough. The good, um, the good, the bad, the ugly, you know, whatever, and, and it could be all good, whatever it is. It's it's tough. Um, especially when, you know, there isn't a lot of, you know, uh like research and like history on what makes a good uh like women's Nordic combined skier. Um, I feel like there is a little bit more of like kind of a general idea when it comes to, um, this doesn't just pertain to Nordic combined, but like any sport that, you know, ha has had the trial and error process. And I feel like there is a little bit more of that still happening in women's Nordic combined, which does make it frustrating sometime, sometimes, but I feel like it, we're working around it. We have a team um, of coaches that helps us research, helps us understand what's going on with our training so that we can better ourselves and our uh, performance. What about you, Alexa? Um, I think one of the hard parts is definitely just since it's such a new sport, obviously there's not any like people like women who have finished it and are like moving on to the coaching stage of it. So pretty much all of our coaches are men, which is, which has its good and bad. And it just like changes up the dynamic a little bit. But like one of the like really cool things is like at home, we're on a team with like, like it's a boys and a girls team combined. So I've made like, I trained with many, uh, made friends with a lot of the, guys on my team which is something that you don't always see yeah and Annika um yeah honestly I think it's really hard especially for us like first generation um going into women's Nordic combined you know I feel like especially on USA Nordic um the boys get more benefits more funding um it's really hard for us women to like start paving our paving our way when um you know 
everything is going towards the men and we're thinking more about the men than the women. Well, and it was perfect, your answer actually, because it goes into the next question here. And, and Tess and Alexa, you can weigh in on this as well. What are some of the key differences between the men's and women's sport? Where does the inequality most stand out? For instance, this year at the NCAA basketball tournament, the women's team shared a video of their weight room versus the men's weight room, and there were stark differences. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Tess, we can start with you if you have any more to say on this. Um, and in Annika, you probably have a perspective too. So let's start with Tess on any of the differences that you see that stand out. I mean, Annika just spoke to funding and different things like that. I mean, that's certainly hindering progress because all of this takes a lot of money, the travel, the equipment, the coaches. I mean, it go, the list goes on and on. Um, so let's start with Tess and then Alexa on some of the key differences is where you think it might be hindered and the differences in how the two, two programs are, are treated. One thing that's kind of noticeable is um, the guys team does have more coaches at given times and uh, we have one coach and it's kind of tough sometimes um, if you're not getting something, one coach might not be able to give you uh, like the steps to move on sort of, or like just a kind of idea to put in your head to move on. And sometimes just working with another coach helps immensely. And it's tough when the guys have at least like two to three coaches at a time in places when we have one and <laughs> um, it's a growing sport. We are a small team, but I think that we need the same opportunities as the guys. And it's kind of weird coming from Steamboat where we are a, a team of men and women going internationally and kind of being isolated, not even with uh, away from like um, women ski jumpers as well. We're kind of on our own sometimes. Anyone else? Alexa, do you want to talk about some of the differences that haven't been covered? Um, I mean, I think definitely one of the most obvious, and this is just across the sport, is the competitions. So, Uh-oh, we lost your audio. Alexa, we lost your audio. So hang tight and we'll see if you come back in. Annika, do you want to answer that? And oh, there she goes. What did you, did I break up? Your audio is going a little bit in and out, at least for me. Can you guys hear her? Okay. Alexa, let's test you again. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I'll, I'll restart because I don't know what you heard. But yeah, start at the beginning. The women get only compete on a 90 and 100 meter hill and race a five kilometer race. And then the men get to compete on a 90 meter hill or a 100 meter hill. And then they also get to compete on a big hill, which is a 120 meter hill. And they race a 10K or a 15K or a 5K. And they have many, many more COCs and World Cups and just like opportunities to compete. Whereas like just last season, we got one World Cup in our whole World Cup season. And I think two COCs, which is, it's just, yeah. It's new and emerging. Mm -hmm. Everything, everything's not, the foundation's not been laid yet. Yeah. What about you, Annika, anything to add to this? Yeah, just everything in general, just like Alexa said, um, the men's almost got their whole entire season that was already planned, while ours, half of ours got canceled, and from even the beginning, we didn't have as many, not even nearly as close as the men, um, just, it's, I think it's everything right now, there's, they can't fund us, um, 
you know, we have one coach while the men's have many coaches and then a house that they can stay in in Europe. Um, they train with different teams. Um, they have more wax equipment, more wax techs. And I really feel like we're being left out um, to where, you know, they're still trying to give us opportunity, but not nearly enough to even get started on like the level of competition that we want to train and compete on. And it's um, in those sense, in those senses, it's really frustrating. Um, there's four of us and now there's only going to be three. We have one male coach um, looking at the other, you know, teams, they have massage therapists. Um, they have multiple wax techs, multiple, um, you know, coaches. They just like have it all figured out while I feel like we're playing a catch up game. And when you say they have massage therapists and all that, are you talking about the men's teams or the other women's teams in the world? I mean, men's teams and the other women um, in the world. Yeah, and I think that's something that we should um, talk about briefly here too, because in, in interviewing some other Nordic combined athletes like Todd Lodwick and Johnny Spillane in the past, they were able to talk about the difference between Nordic combined in the US and in Europe. And it was kind of compared to Nordic combined is to Europe as the NBA is to the United States, as far as funding level and how it's treated. And for instance, when Johnny Spillane won his world gold, um, I've heard his mom say she you know, found his the photo of him in all of these international newspapers long before he was ever on the cover of a newspaper here, you know, in the United States. And so um, can you talk about a little bit about what you've seen? So you, you've talked about where men's Nordic combined is in the US, and then you've talked about, you know, the disadvantages that you guys have in the program. But then let's talk about stepped up from the men's US program the men's international program, specifically Europe. Tess, do you want to start there? I mean, just first off, um, in Europe, ski jumping and Nordic combined is such a like part of that culture. So um, I don't know like completely, but it does seem like they have some funding from government as well. And um, my, I was at my dad's the other night and um, one of his friends came by that has been living in Europe and he's like, oh yeah, like I saw, I saw you and like the other girls names in the papers and like, you guys are like on the news and like part of like, like people that like are just living their everyday lives are, you know, reading about Nordic combined ski jumping in their newspapers, seeing it on the news. And I think that makes a really big difference when it comes to just funding and um, there's not as big of an atmosphere in the US or as many opportunities because I mean, Europe has tons of facilities of ski jumping and uh, you know, jumping different hills gives you more uh, experience and kind of gives you like a better kind of like uh, training experience and that's why we go over there a lot and it I don't know it just seems like there's a little bit more support from uh like normal uh, normal people well and as Annika referenced when you have the massage therapists and you have the ski techs that all matters that supports you that supports your equipment technology and ski wax matters, that takes time, right? That affects your jumping, that affects your skiing. So having all of that dialed in by pros, by several pros and not having people sort of um, spread too thin is gonna affect your performance. Would you agree with that statement? Yes, it has It has a impact. It does, I mean, if your skis are slow, it's, you're gonna, it's gonna be a tougher day, but um, 
yeah, I mean, having access to massage therapists and like uh, PT or sport or like team doctors while you're on the road is sometimes really nice, especially if uh, you're having issues, if you're hurt in any way or, I mean, yeah, like, um, I mean, this is kind of Annika's story, but like we were, we went to uh, world championships and Annika had a hurt ankle and she, um, I mean, we do get support from other teams. It is a nice, like, um, atmosphere sometimes, but Annika, uh, got some help from like the Japanese team. And I mean, that's definitely her story if she wants to talk about it, but it is kind of, uh, apparent. Annika, do you want to share that story? And sorry, I've been calling you Annika the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's hard when we don't have the funding and money to have like PTs, physical, like uh, massage therapists. So when last year in our COC in Eisenert, we went on a hike and I ended up rolling my ankle really bad. And I have a lot of history um, with rolling my ankles and it's gone to a point where it's, it's really bad when I roll my ankle. So um, when that happened, I didn't get any support from the U.S. team, but thank God the Japanese team was right away um, helping hands were out and he actually saw me three times and didn't ask for any money or um, any kind of nothing. It was just, he just wanted to help because we don't have the resources. And I think he was a big reason of why I was able to compete um, a couple days later, because no way that I could have done that without him. Well, not only does that speak highly of the Japanese team, but I think it's a good lesson for the U.S. team to know, to know that you may not have been there otherwise, because it's hard to know can you, can you compete on this? Should you not compete on this? It's, and it sounds like maybe a familiar injury that may have started in gymnastics. I was a gymnast for 10 years and I know the ankles definitely take a beating. Yeah. What about you, Alexa? Um, do you have any um, perspective on this, on sort of the international differences, um, not only how that might affect it, the U.S. team in general, but then how that then trickles down to the new women's team. Um, one of like, well, so last season, um, me and Tess spent a bunch of time in Lillehammer, Norway, which is a pretty small town, actually. It reminded me a lot of Steamboat, but what really... Uh-oh, we lost you again, Alexa. <laughs> something's happening to Alexa's audio we'll go back to you we'll remember the Lillehammer story and we'll come back to you um okay so this is kind of taking this conversation we're having and we're going to throw it on its head what advantages do women have in Nordic combined over men yes we'll start with you and you're muted no. <laughs> um, I do think that there is a, a drive of like um, getting to the same level as the guys and wanting, I mean, I guess every athlete wants to do their best, but I don't know. It just seems like there is a little bit more of a, um, a push. And especially in this last year, we saw the level of competition just rise immensely and I think that that could be a good um advantage if we could if just overall women's Nordic combined can keep that up because maybe at some point we will be seen as equal to the men and it's tough sometimes when you are looked at as women have issues with, or not issues, but have the a disadvantage in athletics because of hormones and everything. And when that equals out or gets closer to equal, I think, I don't know where I'm going with this, sorry. 
I follow you. That's making sense. Annika, what about you? What do you think the women's advantage is over men in the sport? Um, like Tess said, I think we have a little bit more of a push. Um, I think it took a lot more to get, um, you know, these sports um, like forward, I guess. So I think that they are giving us a little bit more opportunity to have like our world champs that we had this year and our, our first world cups. Um, so yeah, I'd like to follow up with what Tess said. I think there's more push in our sport. Got, you've got some fire behind you. <laughs> yeah. And then Alexa, it looks like you may have fixed your audio. You, audio. you want to tell us the Lillehammer story? Oh, yeah. So uh, me and Tess spent a bunch of time in Lillehammer last season. And what kind of blew me away was it was about the same size as um, like the town felt similar to Steamo. It felt like it was about the same size, but it had two like amazing, like fully decked out, like World Cup um, level cross country stadiums that we got to, we got to ski in both. And I was just like amazed because they had like over like 50 kilometers of skiing in here in Steamboat. Like we don't have like, like we do have good skiing, but not to that level. They're all about it. <laughs> Yeah, that's for sure. Um, so then let's talk about, we've kind of referenced this and Tess, we'll start with you on this question. There is talk about a mixed male and female Nordic combined team. What would that look like in your mind? Uh, do you mean for competition or for like training? Either. I think there are advantages of training with the men because um, like we've seen with our teammate Tara, she, uh, she's 10 years older than me and a lot faster. And I th think that a tough part of the year was she was training with either on her own or with us and being able to ski with people that are a similar speed as you, or that are maybe a little faster and can push you a little bit is a huge advantage. That sounds good. Alexa, what about you? Any advantages of training or competing together? Um, I think that it brings another level to the training. Um, we're able to push each other in a way that's not like extremely competitive. We're like, yeah, I don't know. And also in terms of like you've got like more people to socialize with because traveling with just the three or four of us is very, it's a very small circle for months at a time. And Annika? Annika? <laughs> <laughs> um, I would like, have to agree with both. Um, I think it, it pushes us in a, n a new level. Um, and just in general, like, at the end of our trips, we're like at each other's throats because it's just the three of us. And it's it's really hard. It's not just a couple weeks, it's months on end. And um, just having more people and I'm a very social person. I like being with people. I like meeting new people. Um, I honestly think it's so important to combine teams, even if it wasn't just the men's USA in order to combine team, it could be from all the way to different countries. I think it's really important to meet people and meet your competitors and yeah, just like kind of get familiar with the, with the field you're in. Okay. That sounds great. Um, before we go to questions, I guess I wanted to see if there was anything else either one of you would like to share. Or have we covered it? I just would like to finish off with, um, I'm really fortunate to have found this sport, but I really hope that in the future, um, we can kind of, you know, get our stuff together and we can find more ways to support women. Um, and I think it will bring us such a, such a far away. I think that it will really make a difference. Agreed. 
Well, there's two questions that have come in the chat. One says to ask about the community that the women have versus the men. And I don't know if that's local community or national community or international community, but when you think of the question, community that the women have versus the men, do either of you wanna to respond to that? International, I, they kept clarified, the international community that the women have versus the men. Tess, you wanna start with that? I mean, we are a smaller community and I haven't been part of the men's community, but the women's community is um, pretty close. I mean, we, I, I have for one have talked to or tried to talk to um, as many of the girls as possible. And I do my best to try and learn their names. Uh, there is uh, language barriers, but I think it is a, since it is a smaller community, it's a little bit easier to uh, like get closer with everyone. What about Alexa? Do you have a perspective on that? Yeah. Um, one of the things I think it, that is different than the men is since our field is still pretty small at this moment, um, the same girls that are competing at COCs are competing at World Cups are competing at Junior Worlds. So we, we see each other at pretty much all of the events we're at, whereas like the men, like there's a whole different field that like pretty much all the different or like on different, like at the COCs versus the World Cup and stuff. So just makes it a little bit tighter, I guess. Mm -hmm. And Annika, Annika, sorry, <laughs> doing that. It's okay. Um, I think that since the men have been doing this for a while, um, I guess they're more familiar in their field and their competitors versus us. I think we're every event, I feel like I'm meeting a new person and um yeah it's i think our field um travels together we all go to cocs all go to well our world cup and um i don't think that there's much of a separation because we are so small okay a couple other questions we have a few more minutes um i'll take two more questions here that are already in the chat uh if folks on this chat or other people wanted to come and see you um jump and train say in the next you know month or the, this summer uh what day of the week can they come and see you jump we start training on may 10th but that's most likely going to be dry land um going into the summer i don't know if it's going to be the same schedule but it's usually monday wednesday friday um in the mornings usually until like 11 is that right mm -hmm. yeah like seven seven to eleven but we yeah. think we, yeah, we usually do 7.30, but we're not on the hill until like 8.30. So you're jump and it's all, it's all levels jumping with you guys. Is that correct? Because I know I saw some of the littler guys and all the way up to you guys. Is that correct? Sometimes we, uh, we do have bump jumps on our, uh, on, we have a four, our 45 and our 75 have, um, plastic on them. And then we have two little bump jumps and I think they're trying to build a separate bump jump, um, over by the magic carpet, a 10 meter. Oh, a 10. Okay. That's awesome. So that, that might not be for lower, a, couple years, a little bit lower level to get some of those littler ones going, which is awesome. Right. I mean, that's one more thing that they get to start on in the summer that you guys didn't get. So that's movement in the right direction. Okay, the last question that we have time for so we can be respectful of everyone's time and end at 6.30. To what extent are you three encouraged to speak out succinctly, not quite so demur demurely in order to draw positive attention to the sport, the future of women in the sport? Um, so are you encouraged, you know, we've been pretty candid in this, to draw attention to the future of the sport. Are you encouraged or are you quieted um, as far as trying to really propel the sport and, and kind of breaking those barriers and that glass ceiling, if you will? That's how I interpret this question. I hope I interpreted it correctly. Tess, we'll start with you. I think it's really important to speak out. Um, I always find a little bit of trouble like, 
speaking out against the um, communities that like help you when there are issues. And I, I've been trying to work on that because there are negative things in trying to find um, equality, but um, I think it's really important to speak out as much as possible in a respectful manner to those who are trying to help you as well. Right. It's like you don't you don't want to give up good in the search of perfect. It's a yeah. saying that I hear a lot that I think can apply in this situation. Acknowledging the good while also pushing for better. Alexa, you want to comment on that? Uh, oh, I think we lost you again. <laughs> we, we lost you again. Annika, I'll give it to you. Um, yeah, I think both. Just like Tess said, there are so many disadvantages that um, kind of take a hold or kind of put down the brakes on why we can't move forward. Um, but then again, you know, we were on nine news. We've had a ton of time in the newspaper. Um, I've gotten interviewed multiple times and I think that we're really trying. And I think that's the most important part, but um, it's really important to speak out and, you know, find equality, but um, you can't forget about all the disadvantages we also have. Mm -hmm. Well, I wanna thank the three of you for taking the time tonight to share your story. Um, to, I can speak from the museum's perspective, from my perspective, and I know the town of Steamboat Springs, you guys are a very big deal. And um, we're just really impressed with everything that you're doing. Um, you're doing a great job. We wish you all the luck and success. I know it is a lot of training and a lot of hours, and especially with injuries, uh, can be very, very challenging. And so pushing for this Olympic level, pushing for this world level is an extraordinary, extraordinary thing. So I want to commend all of you. Um, you did a great job on the interview and I just want to thank you and wish you lots of luck. Thank you so much. Thanks everybody, Thanks everybody for joining. And um, this will be recorded and we will have this up on our YouTube channel next week if you'd like to view it or share it with other people. Um, you know, as Annika, Tess and Alexa said, we need to share the story. So it's on YouTube, <laughs> share it and bring attention um, to where the sport needs to continue to go and really jump off your shoulders that you're three athletes, you're, you're, you're doing the pioneering and the sport can jump off your shoulders. And we hope that telling your story and making that available through social media and other channels will help to share your story. Thanks so much. And everyone have a great night. Thank you so much.